It's my honor today to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Christophe Lecouye of the Université Pierre et Marie Curie, who will, who will present for us some findings from his most recent historical research on the environmental legacy of these silicon manufacturing technologies and practices in Silicon Valley. Thermodynamics teaches us that perfect efficiency is impossible. Where there is productive work, there is some inevitable waste in one form or another. The questions faced by every person or organization engaged in productive work are how much waste can be tolerated and how this waste is to be handled and assessed. I look forward to hearing Christoph's insights into how the semiconductor industry in Silicon Valley answered these inevitable questions of waste over time and their consequences. This subject is, for Christoph, an extension in both time and topic of his previous award-winning works in the history of semiconductor electronics and Silicon Valley. His 2006 book, Making Silicon Valley, Innovation and the Growth of High Tech, 1930 to 1970, was published by MIT Press and won the Computer History Museum Book Prize from the Society for the History of Technology in 2009. His 2010 book, co-authored with me, Makers of the Microchip, a Documentary History of Fairchild Semiconductor, was also published by MIT Press and earned the Eugene Ferguson Prize from the Society for the History of Technology in 2013. Professor Lecouillet's return to this stage is something of a homecoming as well. After undergraduate studies at the Sorbonne and graduate work at the Ecole Normale, Christophe earned his PhD in history from Stanford University. Hopefully, you will have all found a card and pencil at your seat. Please jot down a question for Christophe on your card, uh, which my colleagues will collect from you as they sweep down the aisles about halfway through the lecture. And with that invitation, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Christoph to the stage for his lecture titled, Clean Rooms and Dirty Water, The Environmental Legacy of Silicon Valley. Christoph. Thank you, David. Thank you, so, thank you David, for this very uh, nice introduction. And also, thank you for coming. Um, so today, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the history of computing from the, hist from the point of view of the environment and occupational health in Silicon Valley, okay? So as you know, the history of computing so far has been written mostly from the point of view of entrepreneurship and innovation, on innovation in semiconductors, in systems, in software, okay? And um, what I would like to do is to move that perspective to the impact of computing on the environment and on occupational health. Uh, so like many other industries and technologies, computing has had profound impacts on the environment and also on the workers who are actually making these digital devices. So it had um, uh, consequences on, on the, it basically it led to pollution of aquifers, led to the pollution of soils, and also to air pollution uh, in places where these things were manufactured. It's also a source of enormous consumption of electricity, as you may know. So the digital devices consume about 10% of electricity in all uh, advanced countries. Okay, so it's very substantial, which leads to further pollution. And also, um, the manufacture of digital devices led to um, health consequences for the workers and the people working in the fabs and the plants. Uh, poisoning, cancers, birth defects, and so forth. Okay, so major impacts uh, over uh, the last 40 years. So not surprisingly, these, um, the, this pollution uh, led to controversies in places where these things are manufactured. So in the US, it's mostly uh, New York with IBM, Massachusetts, New Mexico, Arizona, and of course, California, okay? But also there have been controversies in other places such as Japan, um, Taiwan, of course, and South Korea, okay? And now there's actually a movement of former workers at Samsung, uh, 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 essentially uh, filing lawsuits against the company for uh, getting cancers from, from, uh, from working in the firms. So, but these controversies have been especially acrimonious in Silicon Valley, okay? And they were probably the most acrimonious here in Silicon Valley. Um, and this is due, I think, for two, to two reasons. First of all, the Silicon Valley was the main 
center for the production of microchips in the world, essentially, from the late 60s to the early 90s. Okay? And it was also a major site of production for the manufacture of disk drives with IBM and other places. Okay? Um, and at the same time, this region that you know well is also a center uh, for um, social and cultural protest. Okay? And it goes back to the 19th century with socialist communes that were established in the Bay Area. Okay? Uh, it goes back also to the very strong labor movement in San Francisco and in San Jose. So actually, San Francisco, as you may know, was, is the only city in the United States that ever had a, a, a mayor coming from labor, okay? from uh, organized labor. And also, San Jose was also a big center for labor unions with canary workers. Um, and at the same time, also in the 60s, 70s, there was this counterculture movement, okay? this uh, new left uh, approach this entire world, uh, movement in, in, in California, in Silicon Valley, that also had an impact on the story that I'm going to tell. So I'm, I'm, going, to try, I'm, tr I'm going to try to answer four questions in this talk, okay? The first question is, how did conflicts on pollution and occupational health play out in uh, Silicon Valley? What were the outcomes? Uh, how did these conflicts transform corporate practices regarding the use and disposal of toxic chemicals, and also how did it change the environmental, the environmental movement? Uh, so, and I'm going to focus especially on the period from the late uh, 1970s to um, the mid 1980s. Okay, so a period of seven to eight years. So, who were the main protagonists in this war in Silicon Valley? Okay, so there were essentially two camps. The first camp was made of labor and environmental organizers, activists, so people affiliated with SCOSH the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, but also the UE. The UE was the United Electrical and Machinery Workers of America, which was a very left-wing union, union, union it was, which was independent, but was not part of the AFL-CIO. Why? Because it had been expelled for having communist ties in the late 1940s. Okay? So these were the types of people who were organizing Silicon Valley in the late 1970s. Huh? And on the other side, what you have is the large semiconductor and computer companies in Silicon Valley. So, Intel, Fairchild, uh, IBM, and so forth. But there were also other types of actors in the story. Uh, physicians, of course, uh, newspapers, and I think especially of the San Jose Mercury News, fire departments, water authorities in, in Northern California, local governments, and of course also federal agencies such as the EPA and OSHA. Okay? And all these actors actually played a role in the story that I'm going to talk about today. So what was really at stake in these conflicts at the beginning. What was at stake in this, these conflicts was the uni unionization of Silicon Valley. That was really the goal, okay, at the beginning. It's only later that environmental concerns surfaced as being the, the primary motive, if you will, of these conflicts, okay? But first, it starts about unions and organizing. Um, so these conflicts were really uh, 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 acrimonious, as I said. Um, led to changes uh, both on the labor side or the environmentalist side and also on the corporate side, okay? So on the uh, corporate side, these conflicts forced companies essentially to pay much more attention to the environment and to the health of their workers, okay? And, uh, very clearly. And at the same time, it changed also the labor movement, if you will, in, in, uh, in Northern California, in Silicon Valley, um, and it changed the environmental movement as well. So it led to the emergence of an anti-toxics movement in Silicon Valley, around the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition. It also um, led to more emphasis on local pollution among the older types of organizations, such as the Sierra Club. Okay? And also, it convinced uh, entrepreneurs and firms in Silicon Valley to finance the pro-business wing of the environmental movement. And I can, I can think, for instance, of Gordon Moore, who became a major patron of these types of activities. So to really understand these conflicts, one has to go back in time and go back to the 1960s, 1970s, okay? And talk about the chemical practices that one can find in firms doing semiconductors in Silicon Valley at that time. And what is interesting is that there's really a, a paradox here, okay? On the one side, you have an industry that is saying that it's very clean, that is harmless, okay? That's a story that goes back to uh, the 1930s. Electronics firms have, saying, have been saying that for a very long time, okay? Um, and um, and the, 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 really the image that the uh, industry wanted to project is the clean room, 
we are clean because our manufacturing spaces are clean. Okay? And this, this truth, if you will, about the cleanliness of the industry was inscribed into zoning, zoning regulations in Silicon Valley. Okay? So semiconductor firms, semiconductor manufacturing was zoned as light manufacturing. Okay? And as a result, could be located close to residential neighborhoods. Okay? So it was not rare to see middle class families living across the street from a semiconductor fab, both in Mountain View and in San Jose. Okay? And this led, of course, to major problems afterwards. Uh, but at the same time, as I said, there's a paradox because this industry is really a chemical industry, as we know well, uh, can, uh, an industry that really uses massive amounts of highly toxic chemicals. So what are these? They are, of course, the, the poison gases that are used to manufacture the chips, like arsine and phosphine. These were uh, gases used in trench warfare in World War I. So they are dangerous indeed. Okay? Um, they were also solvents that turned out to be actually toxic and leading to cancers, such as TCE, TCA, the glycolifers, and the CFCs. And of course, they were the acids, very powerful acids that were used to etch these uh, pieces of silicon. And so, as I said, these uh, um, chemicals were used in very large quantities. Uh, in 1980, there were uh, semiconductor firms in Silicon Valley used about two million gallons of acids. Okay? And they used about half a million gallon of, um, of solvents. So these were large quantities indeed. Okay? Um, and what is interesting too, to, note, to note is that uh, some firms knew early as the 1950s that many of these chemicals were actually very dangerous for people. And that was the case of IBM. Okay? But this information was not, of course, shared with the workers of, of the people in the industry. So what, is, what strikes me about this period of 1960s, 1970s, is that many firms, not all firms, but many, many firms, gave a very low priority to worker safety and environmental protection. Okay? That was clearly not a priority. Um, and also, there was no real structure, with the exception of the company Fairchild, that uh, structure within the firm that would really press for safety and environmental protection. Okay? And the way these safety issues were dealt with at that time was by essentially by uh, setting up safety committees who are made up of volunteers, okay? so technicians, workers, maybe engineers, okay? who looked at uh, who were trying to make the fab safer. But these committees had no, had no, no power. Okay? The people who were really controlling manufacturing were the manufacturing engineers and manufacturing managers. Okay? So they were the ones really controlling the handling of chemicals. At the same time also, there was a very limiting training and worker protection. Uh, this is quite clear uh, from this picture here. You have a, a, a woman uh, working at Fairchild in the early 1960s. She's cleaning uh, transistor headers uh, in uh, solvent baths, as you see here. And you see the protection, right? She has only protection on her fingers. Okay, so she's essentially exposed to solvents every day, uh, eight or nine hours a day. Um, uh, so, and also what is uh, striking is that uh, firms at that time were monitoring toxics through smell. Okay? It's only when smell, somebody smelled a strange odor that people start to worry a little bit. And if the odor was really pungent, then the fab would be evacuated. Okay? And some firms went even further than that. They had identified workers who were highly sensitive to chemicals, and they would essentially send these workers to the fabs to identify uh, toxic chemicals in the air through their bodies. Okay? And this led also to major problems uh, afterwards. So what's the, the outcome of all this? The outcome of all this is uh, lots of fires, explosions. So here you have a picture coming from a Fairchild in the early 1970s. Uh, and what you see here is a fire, a fire in the plating shop. Okay? But there were many fires of that sort. I mean, uh, they were, uh, every week there will be several fires of that sort in Silicon Valley in the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, then um, there would be chemical spills that were very common uh, in firms. And also the other problem was that the, the clean rooms themselves were very poorly ventilated. Okay? Uh, this was done, uh, surprisingly, this was partially due to the fact, um, due to the local regulations, uh, local building codes. Okay? So cities such as, such as, such as Sunnyvale they didn't want the fabs to look like factories. They wanted the, the fabs to look like campus buildings, 
Okay? And they require that the high parapets be built on top of the roof in order to hide the smokestacks. Okay? As a result, all the chemicals that were spewed by the smoke, smokestacks would stay on top of the, 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 the building uh, roofs, right? And there would be chemical pools okay, that would uh, appear on these, um, on these uh, roofs. And then since the air intakes for the clean rooms were also on the roofs, the chemicals would go back into the clean room. And this, the, the workers would be breathing these things constantly. Okay? And this was uh, worsened by the fact that firms tried to recirculate uh, the air as much as possible in order to uh, cut on, on uh, energy costs in the, late, in the mid and late 1970s. Okay? So what's the outcome? The outcome is that the illness rate in the semiconductor industry in 1980 in, in um, Silicon Valley was three times higher than the average rate for all industries in California. Okay? This, was, this was not a safe industry. Okay? Um, and uh, what were these, these uh, illnesses? Uh, what was characterized as illnesses? Uh, acid burns, for instance. So here, the, half of the illnesses were acid burns. Okay? And here you see a worker from Fairchild in 1966 who has been uh, disfigured by uh, powerful acids. And this was common. This was common in the industry. Uh, and also, another major source of illnesses was the inhalation of dangerous chemicals okay, that people encountered in the fab uh, fairly uh, commonly. So how did these firms deal with accidents? How did firms deal with illnesses? Because they were present, they were clear, right? Um, so what often, the, the, from, my, my, from what I've seen in my research, firms dealt, most firms dealt with this uh, by a mix of denial and suppression. Okay, so what, did it mean? what does it mean? It means that uh, manufacturing managers would, cons would dismiss the health concerns of workers, who are women, as female hysteria. And this, I've seen that very often in, in, uh, in interviews. Uh, employees who were too vocal about safety would be asked to leave. Okay? And some firms went as far as creating, as creating special clinics for their workers. And the goal essentially there was to better control the reporting of medical injuries to uh, the state and the federal government, okay? and also to limit the filing of uh, workers' compensation claims. Okay? So they went quite far. Some firms went quite far in that direction. So it's clear that industry, the, the, the firms were not that interested in safety. They were even less interested in environmental protection in the 1960s and in the first half of the 1970s. Okay? So, um, in, at that time, firms would essentially store the chemicals in, um, in tanks uh, that were buried, because that was actually part of the fire code. They, these tanks had to be buried in the ground. They were buried close to the fabs. And there were about 250 such tanks in Silicon Valley by 1982. OK, so a large number of tanks. It turns out that firms were not that interested in what was happening with these tanks. They didn't monitor them that well. OK, and this led also to uh, major problems uh, in the 1980s. Um, firms would also um, uh, dump these uh, chemicals into sewers, okay? That was common. Um, and actually, Gordon Moore has an interesting story saying that um, um, the, uh, when a crews dug up the, first, the sewer line uh, at Intel's first facility, they discovered that all these uh, pipes had a U shape, okay? Why? Because the bottom had, in, had been eaten up by acids. Okay? And that was common. That was common in Silicon Valley, but also common in academic labs doing semiconductors. Okay? Berkeley was doing the same. And as a result, all the piping in the Berkeley uh, building just had the same problems. Okay? So it's common for the 1960s and 1970s. And then uh, people at semiconductor firms in Silicon Valley would also pour a lot of the solvents into dry wells or would essentially uh, put them onto the grounds of industrial sites. Okay? So it's the way people dealt with these uh, chemicals uh, often uh, at that time. So things changed a little bit by the mid-1970s. Okay? And starting in the mid-1970s, firms tend to be more interested and more uh, attuned, if you will, to uh, environmental issues, health issues. Somewhat, not much. Okay? Why? Uh, for essentially two reasons. First of all, there were major accidents that occurred in, 19, in the mid-1970s. And there was especially a big accident at National Semiconductor 
at its plant in Connecticut, okay? And there, seven people died of arsenic exposure, okay? So that was a wake-up call for National. Uh, but also, and the main reason is the fact that the legal environment started to change, okay? And in 1970, Congress passed new laws that led to the formation of EPA and OSHA, okay? So it took about five years for these laws to register in Silicon Valley, okay? And it's in the mid-1970s that firms tried to change their practices a bit, knowing that the environment is changing, okay? So what do they do? They reinforced uh, safety committees. Uh, they trained more their workers about uh, chemical handling. They also started to publish articles uh, on safety in their employee newsletters. Okay? And here you see a, an article um, that was uh, uh, published in the employee newsletter for Signetics in 1978 and urging people to be more careful about chemicals uh, in the plant. Okay? And more importantly, firms start to hire safety engineers. Okay? That's a, new, that's a new, no, novel development for most firms. And Intel, for instance, uh, hires its first safety engineer in 1976. So my, my thesis is that this corporate negligence that can be, I think, fairly well documented, okay, would not have come to light if it was not for a group of young women, okay, uh, who essentially publicized it in the late 1970s and the first half of the 1980s. Who were these women? They, there were three of them. Amada Hose, okay, who was probably the leader of the group, uh, who, has, who was a lawyer trained at Harvard, who was um, also the lawyer for a radical canary worker union in San Jose, also very much involved in left-wing uh, activities, if you will, in, in Northern California. They were the second member of the group was, was Patricia Landborn. So Patricia Landborn was an organizer for the UE, okay? And she'd actually tried, she had worked for National Semiconductor and tried to organize a plant there without success in the mid-1970s. And then there was Robin Baker, uh, who had a uh, public, public health background, but was also friendly to unions. And these women saw safety uh, as the way to organize the semiconductor industry, industry in Silicon Valley. Okay? Up until that time, many unions had tried to organize the industry without success. Okay? Uh, and these women thought that the safety issues that really resonated with work workers would enable them to open up that industry to unions. Okay? And um, these strategies were shared by a new generation, if you will, of UE organizers working at Synetics and National Semiconductor. And uh, UE and the group, this group of women worked very closely in the late 1970s and early 1980s. So what happened? What happened is that these women organized essentially uh, uh, several organizations, um, uh, FaZe, ECOSH in 1978, and then they brought these two things together in 1979, okay? So what was FaZe? FaZe was essentially a research organization, okay? Uh, its goal was to uh, gather information about the chemicals used in semiconductor manufacturing, okay? Nobody outside the industry knew which chemicals were used there, okay? So in order to uh, learn more about these chemicals, they, um, they organized a hotline, and here you have a, leaf a leaflet for that hotline, okay, to attract people, uh, workers to talk to them. And uh, through the hotline, um, they would essentially ask questions about the chemicals used in the plants, and also they would uh, remind um, workers that unions were there to uh, help them, okay? Uh, and then this information would be that fed to an industrial hygienist whom they hired, and they would essentially try to figure out what, which kind of compounds were behind the train names using the, of the chemicals used in the industry, okay? And this led to the production of very detailed leaflets on all the dangerous chemicals used in the semiconductor industry, okay? And then uh, the women also organized workshops you know, for workers in order to increase their awareness of dangers in semiconductor manufacturing. So that was the first, the first organization which was funded by the federal government, by the way, okay? Um, the second organization that they started was ECOSH. So ECOSH was really a pro-union uh, act, um, organization. Okay, it was really actively trying to organize the industry. It was financed by the Catholic Church uh, and also by uh, liberal foundations uh, in Northern California. Okay? And what did it do? It essentially helped UE uh, organize Signetics National Semiconductor. 
Uh, also, in collaboration with the UE, uh, they waged a campaign against the use of TCE, a dangerous solvent uh, in the fabs, and they actually convinced the um, state government to reduce exposure level to TCE, which was a big victory for them. And, but, but more importantly, these women would represent injured workers, people who had been injured through the manif in their, on their job okay, and couldn't work anymore. Okay? Um, and they especially represented three young women, uh, namely uh, Kathy um, He, Martha Rogers, and Kathy Bowerly. These were technicians working in the lab at Signetics. Okay? These were laboratory technicians. Okay? And it turned out that they worked in a, in a, in a room in a, in, in a lab uh, where they were exposed to chemicals, essentially coming from the ventilation system. Okay? Um, they got so sensitive to chemicals that they couldn't work anymore in their lab, and they essentially refused to go back into their working space. Okay? So the manager of Signetics who were dealing with them didn't know what, what to do with them. They didn't want to report uh, lost days to the federal government. So they decided to put them in the cafeteria where they did nothing for about a year. Okay? And the only thing that they were supposed to do was to go through the fabs and identify the dangerous chemicals through their bodies because they were highly sensitive to them. Okay? So, as not, so not surprisingly, they, they got quite tired of this uh, treatment and they rebelled. So what they did is that they contacted ECOSH and asked ECOSH to um, file for a, a hazard investigation of the federal government, namely NIOSH. Okay? So the Synetics management didn't like that move, of course. They were fired, okay? and this led to lawsuits by, uh, um, by, uh, fired by Amanda Hose in, on behalf of these three young women. Um, so this was this story that really coalesced um, the, the, that, that conflict, if you will, uh, in Silicon Valley. And because this case attracted the attention of, again, a very young woman, uh, Susan Yocum, was a reporter for the San Jose Mercury News. Okay? And in April of 1980, she published a series of articles on, well, on the chemical handlers. This was the, the title of the articles. Okay? And these articles, essentially muckraking types of articles, very well researched, that castigated semiconductor manufacturing f uh, uh, com uh, companies for their safety lapses. Okay? So these, these articles were read by hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, and had a major impact on Silicon Valley. Okay? So where did it lead? It led to the fact that many workers started to feel emboldened, and they started to, to uh, uh, sue their companies. Okay? So by the early 1980s, most companies in Silicon Valley, the large ones, the Fairchild, AMD, Intel, AMI, and many others, had tens of lawsuits to contend with, coming from their employees. Okay? Um, uh, these articles also attracted the attention of the federal government. Until then, the federal government had basically ignored the semiconductor industry. Now, because of the articles, the government starts to get interested. And uh, Kalosha and Federal Osha organized uh, large-scale studies on the semiconductor industry. And they also they, uh, launched surprise investigations of fabs of certain firms, such as Intel, AMD and Signetics. Uh, these articles also attracted the attention of local governments and fire departments. Okay? Fire departments were essentially responsible for safety in, in the towns they were, where they were operating. And uh, starting in 1980, these fire departments start to look very carefully at these firms. Okay? So a case in, in point is the Sunnyvale Fire Department. Okay? Uh, in 1980, the Sunnyvale Fire Department sent its firefighters to the fabs and to look for violations, fire violations. And they found 900 of them, which was a fairly large number. Okay? Um, and, um, and actually, the fire department got really hard on it. I mean, uh, took a very hard stand on it and, um, and threatened Synetics to close down six fabs if these uh, violations were not addressed very quickly. Okay? And it was, basically, it was a, a death threat for Synetics because all the fabs, all the main fabs of the company were located in Sunnyvale. Okay? And uh, the Sunnyvale city department, we went even further actually, and imposed a moratorium on further industrial development in 1980. Okay? That was really crisis time for the industry. And so how did the industry react to this crisis? 
So they were essentially two responses. The first, the external response and the internal response. Okay? So on the external side, what did they do? They tried to weaken the, the, the opposition, and they tried to convince people that the industry was indeed very safe. Okay? So weakening, what does it mean? It means attacking the funding of Scosh and Fails. Okay? In 1979, 25 companies in Silicon Valley filed a request to OSHA asking, asking that the grant given by OSHA to FAZE be resigned. Okay? So this request is turned down, but when Ronald Reagan is inaugurated, it's of course accepted, and OSHA cancels the, the grant, which led, which essentially to the closure of FAZE. Okay? So that was one, one, one uh, reaction. Second reaction, is essentially changed the reporting of illnesses. These illnesses were three times higher than the average, so a firm decided to uh, recategorize uh, the, the illnesses, and, um, and um, uh, for example, acid burns moved from illnesses to injuries. Okay, and also firms decided to not report some illnesses anymore. Okay, the result, of course, is that by 1981, there was a major drop in illnesses in Silicon Valley. Okay, and the, the illness rate was then lower than the average in California. And of course, after that, in the, the, the firms, especially the SIA, um, launched a PR campaign saying that the industry was very safe. I mean, they had the statistic to show it, right? Okay, so that's the, the uh, external re response. The internal response was a major effort, I mean, really major effort, to address the dangers within the firms, okay? And that was especially the case at Cinetics, but also at Intel. And Gordon Moore has a lot to do with it. Okay? Some firms, such as National and others, also invested quite a bit in it, but quite not as much. Cinetics and Intel were really the, the leaders in that field. So what did these firms do? They started to establish safety departments, which they had never been done before, and gave them large budgets. Okay? Uh, they also hired professionals, uh, safety engineers, industrial engineers, from the federal government or from firms in the East. Okay? So they built very good staff, so very capable people, very capable safety engineers and industrial hygienists. And these uh, new staffs are going to change deeply the ways in which the firms are going to deal with chemicals. So what do they do? They uh, deploy new uh, technologies to handle these chemicals. So here, what you have is two pictures coming from Fairchild in the early 1980s. Huh? Uh, so what you notice first is that uh, so um, that the, the operator there is much better protected than the women we saw in 1960. Huh? Okay. Then also uh, Fairchild develops these stations to deal with uh, acids, you'll see up there, and then also uh, deploys carts, uh, heavy duty carts, to, uh, to move the chemicals within the plants because many of the spills would be occurring uh, when chemicals will be moving from one uh, place to the other, okay? So it's a essentially of limiting, limiting the number of chemical spills um, uh, at Fairchild. Uh, another thing that they did is that they essentially started to use double piping uh, for, the, for carrying uh, toxic gases within the, 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 the plant in order to uh, limit um, micro leaks. Huh? So they would micro leaks from these pipes. So in order to avoid them, you have to put two pipes huh, on the, the gases. Um, then also these people started to uh, introduce uh, sensors within the, the plants to monitor dangerous gases, dangerous chemicals in the air. Okay, so it takes about five years for them to find the right technologies and to be able, actually be able to find these chemicals, identify these chemicals, but it's done. And then also they uh, established very uh, thorough training programs for workers uh, in order to make sure that the workers are more careful about uh, the chemicals they work with. And then finally, they organize uh, chemical emergency response uh, teams that are going to deal with these fires and these chemical spills that are uh, almost daily occurrences in Silicon Valley by the early 1980s. So the third, the third response is collaboration, okay? So firms know they have the same problems, uh, namely they have scotch on their back, okay? And they're going to collaborate. So what do they do? They're going to uh, create a, the Bay Area Electronic Safety Group, okay, that's set up by the safety engineers at Intel, Fairchild, and MRX. And the goal of that organization is to share safety practices across the industry and across, actually, Silicon Valley in general. Okay? 
Um, and this was, it is a very, uh, and the, the, what this organization really does is that it's going to share the best practices developed by the larger firms and give them to the smaller firms that don't have quite the resources to develop uh, uh, very for safety programs. Um, and uh, this is a very successful endeavor which leads to the creation of a professional society for safety engineers in the semiconductor industry, which still exists today. Um, so what are the results of these, of these major, effort, major efforts um, on, on all sides huh, by uh, semiconductor firms? So first of all, the, the first result is that they essentially kill the, kill the UE. Okay? Um, the, the safety program essentially undermine the claims by the UE and SCOSH. Okay? Uh, and then firms, especially Synetics, Synetics National Semiconductor, go further than that, and in late 1981, they fire all the UE organizers in the plants. Okay, and that basically kills off the UE, it never goes back to Silicon Valley. Um, that's, that's one thing. The second thing, too, uh, these uh, changes uh, enables um, local firms to limit new lawsuits coming from employees. Okay, so well, when you, you see, if you look at the Evolution of these lawsuits, they start to drop uh, in, in the, oh, 1983, 1984. Okay? And then also, uh, these programs enable firms to prevail in almost all of these lawsuits. Okay? So it's, a, it's, a, it's really a success on the uh, legal side. But then what's maybe the most important is that because of these uh, efforts, these programs, the industry becomes indeed safer. Okay? That's especially the case of Signetics. And here I've, I'm showing you two statistics. Oh? from that time uh, period. So uh, from uh, 1979 to 1983, the number of new workers' compensated cases just dropped substantially uh, from uh, 870 to 108. Okay, so it's substantial if you take into account that the number of workers is about the same during that period at Signetics. And also the number of work days lost to injuries. So after, after the re recategorization of injuries in 1980, huh, is going to drop down uh, from 80, 848 to 417 between 1981 and 1983. Okay, so sub something substantial. It, the fabs get indeed safer for people who work there. So, but this is only the first part of the story. Okay, uh, what's interesting is that as firms start to really control their chemicals much better, okay, then they discover other problems. Okay, and uh, for example, in late 1981, Lee Neal was the safety, uh, safety director at Fairchild, sends a, a team of inspectors, if you will, of his people working for him, to uh, Fairchild's plant in South San Jose, on Bernal Avenue, okay, in South San Jose. And there, what do they discover? They discover that um, the, um, the, the waste uh, uh, solvent tanks, the, 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 the the, the, the tank where uh, the company would be storing its waste solvent was empty. Okay? And it turns out that uh, this thing had been empty for about two years. Okay? And that m more than 40,000 gallons of TC exiline acetone had been poured into that thing. Okay? Um, so Fairchild, by law, was forced to report that, um, that leak and reported it to the uh, Water um, Resources Control Board, which is the state agency that is responsible for um, clean water in California. And they also reported that their finding to the Great uh, Water Ox Company, which was a small firm that was pumping water from the aquifer in San Jose and selling it to San Jose resi residents. Okay? Um, it turns out that um, for about a year, the uh, Water Resource uh, Board did nothing about it, which is quite surprising, I mean, knowing their mission, right? And this led one of the employees of that, uh, to leak that information to the San Jose Mercury News. And in uh, late 1981, the San Jose Mercury News publishes a very inno small, innocuous article about the fact of, uh, about the solvent tank that's empty at Fairchild. Okay? So this matter may have quickly disappeared from public view if the article had not been read by Lauren Ross. So Lauren Ross was a very uh, energetic, articulate young woman, a young mother living in Los Paseos neighborhood. Uh, Los Paseos neighborhood is the neighborhood behind the plant, okay? Which was a middle class neighborhood in South San Jose, 
And um, she had a baby daughter with a congenital heart defect. Okay, and she, and, and, the, and the baby was born a few months earlier, and she started to wonder whether there's a connection between uh, the, the, the empty tank, if you will, and uh, the fact that the daughter had such a condition. Okay, uh, and just before moving on to the next slide, what you see here is the, um, the um, look, uh, a map of this area in South San Jose. Huh? With here, you have the fabs, that you can see a picture on top, the Fairchild fabs. And uh, here, what you see is the plume of chemicals okay, that seep very deeply into the ground, like to uh, 140 feet down. down okay? That's the place where people pump their drinking water. Okay? Um, so, so, in order, so let's see if we go back to Lauren Ross. Lauren Ross um, wonders whether there was a connection. She's going to uh, uh, investigate that by talking to her neighbors. And she discovers that many families in the neighborhood have the same problem, okay, namely kids with uh, similar problems. And this leads to essentially organize the neighborhood and to publish a, um, a, uh, an open letter to the mayor of San Jose demanding public action. And so the, the story, and there's, there's a really, there's a, a constant outrage coming from that neighborhood for good reasons, right? Um, and Fairchild doesn't quite, doesn't quite know how to handle that problem, okay? And the spokesman of Fairchild is going to tell that there's no connection between, TC well, nobody has ever proved the connection between TCA and childbirths, and uh, defects, right? And also he's going to argue that um, that little bit of chemicals in the drinking water doesn't do any bad, and it's, it's not, it's not, doesn't hurt anybody, okay? So it's the thing not to say, essentially, right? Um, and this leads to even more outrage, and also it leads to, um, uh, the fact that uh, other people start to get interested in the story. So one is Susan Yoakum, whom we know already, okay? And she starts to publish a number of articles about Lauren Ross in the neighborhood in, the 19, 1982, in 1982 and 1983. So she covers the story extremely well. And then uh, it, of course, of course, attracts the attention of Scosh, Amanda Hose and Patricia Landborn, okay? So they approach the group, and Amanda Hose is going to, do, is going to file lawsuits on their behalf against Fairchild, against the Water Resource Board, against the Great uh, uh, Oaks Water Company, and also against IBM, which has a similar solvent uh, problem in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, so this, this uh, lawsuit essentially forces the Water Resource Board to uh, do something, and they're going to establish, to launch a large-scale investigation of um, uh, uh, the, the aquifers in 1982 and 1983, and they discover essentially that there are 150 additional contaminated sites in Silicon Valley. So essentially everywhere uh, uh, from Palo Alto to South San Jose. Okay, so just. So how, does, how do companies respond to that problem? So this is a major problem that, uh, uh, that, uh, that attracts enormous amounts of attention among people who live here. Um, so companies are going to uh, uh, essentially respond to that problem very much in the same way they had responded to the previous problem, namely the problem with uh, the synectics uh, technicians, okay? They're going to build an internal expertise about the environment within the firm, okay? It's a time when Intel, Fairchild, National, Synectics are going to build environmental engineering groups and hire professional environmental engineers. Uh, and they also uh, are going to hire uh, engineering firms, environmental engineering firms, to try to deal with these chemical plumes uh, in the uh, local aquifers. So this is big business. This is really a major activity. In the case of Fairchild, uh, it means essentially building a clay wall very deep down into the ground, okay, at very high cost, $25 million between 1981 and 1986, okay? That's at the time when Fairchild has some substantial financial problems. So $25 million is something for them, okay? And, and also, we can see similar investments uh, by other firms. Uh, so I think people have estimated that about um, firms in, in Silicon Valley uh, spent about $17 million between January of 1982 uh, to July of 1984 to stop the leaks, okay, and start to remediate the, the aquifers. So, and that's, again, that's substantial money. That's a time, a crisis for the semiconductor industry in Silicon Valley. It's a time when the Japanese essentially um, attacking the memory business, and it's a time when firms such as Intel are fairly close to bankruptcy. Okay, this is really also another crisis 
that goes on top of the Japanese crisis. Okay. So for Scotch, it's a godsend. Okay. You have an industry which is really in trouble with the local uh, communities. And Scotch is going to size on that problem in order to revive its unionization effort. Okay? So this time, the, 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 the partner is not the UE. The UE is gone. Okay? So the new partner is the Central Labor Council of Santa Clara County. Namely, it's the, the, um, the, the, the umbrella organizations for all the locals that belong to the AF AFL-CIO in Santa Clara County. Okay? And um, the uh, SCOSH, in collaboration with the Central, Central Labor Council, is going to start a new, organization, a new project within SCOSH called the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, okay, which still exists today. Um, and it's an organization that's, that's led by um, Ted Smith, whom you see here on the back. Okay, Ted, Smith, Ted Smith is a lawyer for the AFL-CIO, so he's very uh, well introduced in labor circles in San Jose. Uh, and he's also the husband of Amanda Hose of Scotch. Okay, so it's also a family business. Um, and the other key person behind Sil the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition is uh, Peter Cervantes Gorchi, we will see here uh, with the mustache in the, the middle. Okay, so he's the business manager of the Central Labor Council in uh, Santa, Clara, uh, Santa Clara County. Um, and he's also the chair of the board of the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition. Okay. So what's the objective of that coalition? And it's very clear. I mean, it's, it's very clear to everybody uh, within Scotch and uh, Labor. The, the goal is to capitalize on public outrage regarding the drinking uh, water problem, okay? to bring workers and community residents together in the battle, the battle against toxics. Okay? But it's also for them a way to create a favorable environment for the organizing of the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley. Okay? And their assumption is that community support would help them uh, in their uh, fights against companies. So how does it play out? Um, the first project that they work on, um, um, and I'm sorry, so what do they do? Um, they essentially try to create a coalition to reinforce, so labor has to go beyond labor, essentially. So what do they do? Uh, they are going to uh, uh, ally themselves with the hundred injured workers working with Scosh. Okay, so people, there were hundreds of them okay, who had been deeply hurt and injured and couldn't work anymore. Um, they also, what they do, they are going to um, associate themselves with the neighborhood associations, such as the one in Los Paseos, okay, in order to build a larger movement. And what they actually do is that they capture, if you will, that these local movements coming from the neighborhoods. And then also they are going to ally themselves with uh, a few uh, environmental organizations in, organizations in Northern California. One of them is the local chapter of the Sierra Club, but also there are a few others. And it turns out it's quite difficult for them to find allies in the environmental movement. Why? Because the heads of these environmental uh, organizations usually are the executives of high-tech firms. They are not going to help, want to help labor very much, right? But still, they are able to find CBE and the Sierra, and local chapter of the Sierra Club to help them. So what do they do? The first project is to um, uh, insert themselves into the debate on the storage of chemicals. Okay, so the, the, after the, this solvent tank debacle, the question that's clear for everybody is, how can we avoid such a thing again? Okay? And there's a, a substantial debate within Silicon Valley on how to do so. Okay, so SVTC is going to uh, push um, for uh, double containment, the, namely the fact that there should be that, that these chemicals should be essentially in two tanks, okay? Uh, they are going also to ask for the monitoring of these, um, of these tanks for electronic means in order to find leaks very quickly. Um, and also, and then they go further than others, they're going to ask um, for protection of whistleblowers who, um, who, uh, against retaliations from their companies. And they also are going to um, uh, ask that companies report the chemicals they use to city governments. Okay. So this is really half a success for SVTC. Um, why? Because um, they essentially uh, they, they failed to obtain uh, the last two uh, provisions that appear here. Okay. Why? Because the industry is really opposed to it. It's not going to work. Okay. So uh, uh, SVTC, but the, maybe the, the main uh, outcome of this, uh, uh, of this controversy 
is that SBTC becomes really uh, worth um, um, a force to contend with in Silicon Valley. It's a presence, okay? It organizes uh, um, uh, press conferences, and we see here on top, and also it's very present in the neighborhoods. And here you have a leaflet from 1983, huh? pushing for, uh, for a cleanup in uh, San Iver. So that's the first project. The second project for SVTC is to uh, demand that the cleanup of Silicon Valley aquifers be accelerated. So firms such as Fairchild would be arguing then that it would take up to 100 years to clean the aquifers. Okay? So this was considered to be unacceptable by SVTC, and they essentially uh, wanted this schedule to be accelerated very substantially. So the way to do so for them was to bring in the federal government, namely bring EPA into the story. But until that time, EPA is not present. Huh? It's not really act, an active member of that story in Silicon Valley. And um, in order to call in the federal government, SVTC is going to build a very big com campaign in Silicon Valley. Okay? They are going to um, organize a, a petition that is going to garner thousands and thousands of signatures. They are also are going to organize very emotional meetings in, in the various cities in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and it's a success. In the fall of 1984, DPA is going to uh, propose to put uh, 19 Silicon Valley sites on its list of super fun sites, namely the sites that are the most polluted in the United States. And by uh, 1985, this list moves to 25 sites in Silicon Valley. And what's interesting, 29 sites. And what's interesting, it's the largest number of, of sites for any county in the United States. Okay? So for DPA, in some ways, Silicon Valley is the most polluted region in the US. Okay, and this is a major coup for SVTC, of course. I mean, they have basically killed the, um, this, this um, uh, discourse of industry, namely that it's a clean industry. Okay. So that's a success for SVTC. But this success doesn't translate into the organizing of, this, of the high tech business in Silicon Valley. And there it's a failure. Okay. Uh, in 1983, uh, the AFL-CIO is trying really hard to organize Atari, which is then one of the largest firms in Silicon Valley. It's a failure, okay, which really uh, is a major setback for that strategy. And then um, the groups, uh, knows of, of a setback, uh, uh, Seventh Gotchi loses power within the council. These are the internal fights, and he loses the, those fights. And then also Landborn, which was the executive director and one of the, 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 one of the key people at Scotch, leaves as well in 1985. Okay, so that's basically the end of, of that story. Um, at that time, uh, Scosh essentially abandoned its goal of organizing Silicon Valley, and they're going to focus mostly on service to injured workers and also on education, educational programs. And then SVTC, which was part of Scosh, spins off okay, and becomes an independent organization that uh, emphasizes, emphasizes environmental issues. And what it's going to do over the next 20, uh, 15, 20 years is going to uh, focus on the implementation of the EPA cleanup program. It's also going to fight the industry on other grounds, and it's the handling of, of toxic chemicals, for instance, arsenes and phosphine. Okay, but it's also um, uh, air pollution in Silicon Valley. And it turns out that IBM, uh, the IBM plant in, in, in San Jose, is the largest polluter in the U.S. Air, for, for air pollution. Okay, so then so there's a campaign then against uh, IBM. So in conclusion, I would like to go back to, to the story and try to um, uh, draw some lessons, okay? Um, first of all, it seems to me that Silicon Valley was really fertile ground for this type of controversy that I talked about today, right? Uh, uh, about uh, the environment, about uh, occupational health, and largely because of the ways in which industry was dealing with these chemicals in the 1960s, 1970s. But it's also, it's also very likely that the full extent of pollution and workplace hazards would have never been known and addressed if it was not for these young women whom I talked about today. Huh? So, namely, uh, the people who started Scosh, like Hose, uh, Landborn, and, and, uh, and uh, Baker, uh, Susan Yoakum of the San Jose Mercury News, uh, Lauren Ross of Los Paseos Neighborhood, and also the technicians at Signetics, okay, that were uh, courageous enough to, to uh, fight against um, Signetics. And, and, and from my point of view, these the, were the people that really forced companies to address the issues uh, uh, in, in Silicon Valley regarding the environment and uh, regarding uh, uh, health. And they were the ones that really forced them to hire very tech competent people to do so. Okay? And, 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 and these people actually do, do make a change um, in the region. 
So what are the lessons we can draw from this story? The first lesson, it seems to me, is that um, uh, there were many sources of pollution, if you will, in Silicon Valley. Of course, there were the practices of the industry, the fact that it was uh, using huge amounts of chemicals, toxic chemicals, but also, and that's important, it's important to note that regulations played a role as well in this debacle. Okay? There were these building regulations in Sunnyvale that led people to get sick inside the, the, the buildings, okay? and also uh, there was this regulation regarding the storage of chemicals in burning tanks that essentially led to these uh, leaks that, that uh, uh, polluted the, the aquifers in Silicon Valley. Um, so that's one first lesson that I can get. The second lesson that I can get from this story is that how difficult it was to unionize Silicon Valley. Okay? Here you have the EUA, you have the FRCAO that really focus on that uh, uh, goal and fail. Okay? So why do they fail? It has a lot to do with the, the nature of the workers okay, who move a lot, who are often are from the Philippines and other places. They're not really fully socialized in the US. Uh, it's also due, and I think more importantly, to the fact that um, companies were deeply opposed to unions, uh, largely because they felt that um, uh, these unions were a, a, a death threat, a real danger for them, and would essentially slow them in addressing new changes in technology in mar the marketplace. Okay, that's the, the, the main idea that's behind that uh, opposition. Um, also, another factor that's important is the fact that the labor movement was divided. Okay, on the one hand, you had the UE that was close to the Communist Party. On the other side, you had the FLCIO, and they never collaborated. Okay, so the outcome might have been somewhat different if those two forces had collaborated and tried to organize Silicon Valley. And also, I think, and the last lesson I can get from this story is that um, there was not enough community support coming to, to help the organization of Silicon Valley. Why? Because middle class people in Silicon Valley were, were cared about drinking water, didn't care that much about workers. Okay, so there was, this coalition never really worked that well. And then the third uh, uh, lesson I can get from uh, this story is that um, the anti-toxics movement that's basically um, pushed by uh, SVTC has, a, has very deep labor roots, okay? And these roots are essentially with the UE, okay? A very confrontational uh, type of, um, of, uh, of um, uh, labor um, uh, organization and that really shaped that movement in Silicon Valley. Okay? Namely, it's highly confrontational, it's deeply anti-management, okay? it's also anti-capitalist, and it's pro-labor. Okay? That's re it's very unusual. I mean, many toxics, there, are, there were many toxics movement, anti toxic movement in the US around that time, but none of them has really that, that, that nature. Okay? And what is interesting is that these organizers uh, who really want to organize Silicon Valley discover that's not possible, and they move to the, into the environmental issues. That's SVTC, okay? So that's basically the, 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 the source is really also coming from the failure of this organizing drive. So why is this story interesting and important for Silicon Valley today? Okay? Um, it seems to me that's important because the conflicts and also the practices I talked about today really shaped the Silicon Valley you live in now, okay? At least from the uh, union and um, environmental aspects of it. So what were the, the legacies, if you will, of these events? The first one is uh, just uh, uh, epidemic, uh, basically an epidemic of cancers uh, among people working the fabs and also people drinking the water in Los Paseos neighborhood. Um, another uh, legacy is the pollution of aquifers, okay? And it's clear that these aquifers are never go back to their pre-1960 state, okay? It's basically, it's, it's never going to be back the way it was before. Um, the third uh, legacy, it seems to me, is the fact that firms in Silicon Valley started to get much more interested in the environment in occupational health, okay? And that really started the trend uh, up, up, up until today. So, um, and uh, for example, in the 1990s, Intel invested enormous amounts of resources in making the swath safer, okay? So that's something that goes back to the late 70s, but that's up, 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 until, up until now today, okay? So I think Intel has 600 people working on safety in these fabs now, so it's, which is a major uh, effort. Um, the fourth uh, legacy is these massive uh, remediation programs uh, run by the EPA, which is still around today in Silicon Valley. There are about now 23 sites, CPFN sites in Silicon Valley today, so 
um, uh, all the way from Palo Alto to San Jose. The third, uh, the, the, the next uh, uh, legacy, if you will, is the fact that Silicon Valley remain non-unionized, which is still the case today. I mean, this was a fact, this was a conflict that really defined the, the workplace, if you will, in Silicon Valley uh, from the uh, late 1970s on. And, but what is interesting is that the labor organizers, that's uh, part of the story, like people like Patricia Landborn, got lessons from their failure. Okay? And what they got from this failure is that they didn't have enough community support to uh, force firms to accept unions. Okay? And uh, so essentially they applied this lesson in the early 1990s, mid 1990s, when they tried to uh, organize hotel workers and janitors in Silicon Valley. Okay? And the way they did that, they did that essentially by aligning, them, aligning themselves with Hispanic neighborhoods, Hispanic associations in San Jose. Okay? And they succeeded. Okay? Janitors in Silicon Valley are now unionized. And then, the, the, it seems to me that the, the last, the, the last um, uh, uh, legacy, if you will, of these controversies, these fights, is the fact that the um, movement regarding environments has changed, okay? partially because of that. Uh, it led to, for example, the emergence of new attacks of toxic movements in Silicon Valley, uh, an emphasis on environmental justice, and also the fact that uh, some of the key entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley started to fund the movement as well. So I, I will stop there, and I will be happy to get your questions. So yeah, so the first question is, uh, what is the current state of toxic material um, in the valley? So um, the, 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 I think the, 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 what's interesting there is that, as you know, Silicon Valley has shifted, right? OK? Um, it was a major center for the production of microchips in the 1970s up until the um, mid 1980s, I mean, there they were, I mean, there were 50,000 people making microchips in Silicon Valley in 1985, okay? This manufacturing has almost disappeared, not fully, but largely disappeared, okay? So the toxics are not the same anymore, right? Uh, the toxics are more going to come from uh, biotech companies, going to come from uh, 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 medical device firms, that sort of thing, okay? And uh, if you look at the profession, I mean, at, at the ways in which the, the um, the programs such as the uh, UC extension programs dealing with safety, uh, they are going to see essentially they're shifting themselves. They're essentially um, now not so much training people for semiconductors, they're training safety people for biotech and medical devices. Okay, so the, 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 there's still, there are of course still toxics, but the nature of the toxics and the source of the toxics is different. Huh? So that was the first question. Um, No, so where fabs uh, outside of Silicon Valley also classified as light manufacturing and located in uh, resi residential areas. So I think it's, it's a very inqu interesting question. Um, and I have to admit that I really don't have a good answer for that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, so actually I, I don't really know about the location of the TI fabs and the Motorola fabs and that sort of thing. But what I know is that the, um, the, the makers of arsine and phosphine, okay, now these very dangerous gases, uh, are their plants within cities, within residential neighborhoods. Okay? And this led to, uh, especially in Southern California, this led, of course, to major controversies there as well. Okay? Um, so how do the environmental concerns and responses in Silicon Valley uh, compare with other places in the U.S., okay? So uh, there were also controversies, there were also conflicts in other places, uh, uh, in like in New York, in, uh, around the, 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 uh, in the IBM fabs there. Uh, there have been also substantial conflicts in New Mexico and Arizona, okay? Um, and, and there, the, the culprit or the, 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 um, the target was Intel, okay? So the, the story is not that different. Um, and also, if you think about the fabs of Silicon Valley firms located outside of the U.S., okay, there were quite a few of them, including in Scotland, and there the story is essentially the same. Okay, so same problems that occur just 10 years later than in Silicon Valley. And then the next question is, uh, you speak of um, semi-industry pollution in absolute terms. Uh, how does it compare to other industries, such as... Um, Steel making, fabrication, oil and gas production, refining, coal mining, 
uh, agriculture and fertilizer manufacturing, chemical manufacturing. Of, co of course, all these industries are highly um, polluting. Huh? All of them. They've been polluting, some of them polluting since uh, the beginning of the 19th, 19th, 19th century, so that's not a new phenomenon. Okay? Um, so that's basically the same in so many ways, right? Uh, what's, the, what's not the same is the discourse. Okay? Uh, the oil industry, I think, uh, doesn't claim that it's clean. Okay? And I don't think it ever did. Okay? Um, same for chemical manufacturing, right? But the difference here is that the semiconductor industry, industry did claim that it was clean. Okay? So I think that, that, that gives a different uh, twist to the story. Um, next question. Uh, could you discuss the role of local, state, and federal governments in the production of the chemical handling regime in Silicon Valley in the 1960s and 1970s? So this is a very good question. Uh, I'm still doing research on that, okay? Uh, to see essentially the role of, of these governments in, in essentially uh, uh, dealing with these problems in Silicon Valley 1960s, 1970s. So I really don't have a full answer to that, okay? But what I've seen, uh, from what I've seen, um, it's clear that the only authority, local state authority that was interested in that, I mean that was active in that, was the um, board uh, dealing with air pollution in the Bay Area, okay? And quite early on, they, um, they put pressure on firms to uh, limit uh, pollution coming from the smokestacks. Okay, so that's clear. And I've, I've seen uh, documents uh, showing that starting in the uh, early 1960s, mid-1960s. Okay? Um, what is clear as well from what I've seen is that uh, local governments were not really following that much uh, uh, local firms in doing semiconductors. Um, um, and I've seen, for instance, um, documents related to uh, Plessis Semiconductor, which was, I think, located in Mountain View, huh? and doing atrocious things. Uh, and it turns out the Mountain View uh, city government didn't do very much about this, and that was in the mid-1970s. So the, government, the city governments were not really that involved, even in cases where they were clear, uh, I mean, just uh, very strange things going on. Um, so that's, that's my question for now, and hopefully I'll have a better question soon, a better answer soon. Um, can you address the economic and environmental impacts of, um, yeah, I'm not sure I fully understood so the, the question, so I might, I might uh, uh, drop it and move to the next one. Um, so was the cleanup effort of toxic spills, such as at Fairchild um, in the South Bay, enough? Um, I, think it's a, it's a, I think it's a question that should be asked to uh, our grandchildren, right? Or to uh, our children. Um, it's, I mean, this is still going on, and it's, I'm not sure that we have, a, we have a, a real good answer so far. Um, so what disposal method existed in the 1970s? That's an, also an interesting question. So the first disposal was the sewers, okay? or putting things on the ground or in dry pits. Okay? That was highly common. Okay? Uh, but starting in the 1970s, um, the uh, two uh, waste disposal sites opened in the Bay Area. Okay? And, uh, and firms, uh, some firms did actually send their waste there. Okay? But not all, but some. So they, 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 there was a, a beginning of a regulation, if you will, of the disposal of, of waste coming from the industry. Ah, so um, ad, in, are there connection in your view uh, with the mercury pollution in this area from the gold rush um, in uh, Sinaba mining in New, Al in New Almaden and um, residual of mercury in, in San Francisco Bay Muds. So that's an interesting question as well, okay? So what is to, what's important here to note is that Silicon Valley, I mean, what we call now Silicon Valley, was not a pristine area in 1960. That's clear, okay? Um, there have been cement factories, there have been many things going on around, around there. Also the agriculture uh, in, in, in what's now called the Silicon Valley was also uh, uh, really taxing on the aquifers and that sort of thing, okay? So it was not a pristine environment uh, when the semiconductor industry started to move here, okay? Um, um, so it, basically that, that pollution went on top of the types of pollution that came from previous activities before. Uh, then um, what pollution does IBM emit? Okay, so, uh, so IBM, 
was a big polluter. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the plant in, uh, in um, San Jose was a big polluter in two different ways. First of all, it was the source of a major solvent plume in the deep aquifer in San Jose, okay? so where people were drinking their water from. Okay? And also, it was uh, uh, the largest user of CFCs in the US. The largest user of CFCs in the US in the late eight, in the um, let's see in the early 90s. Okay, and uh, this led to a, a new conflict, of, of course, uh, and a new uh, fight run by the SVTC, huh? and and uh, IBM was essentially, uh, and then IBM um, uh, instead of fighting the environmentalists started to talk to them and started to negotiate. Okay, so that's that's that's, that's a new turn for what happens next. So what is also an issue, uh, because labor unions were always weak in Silicon Valley, they still are. Yeah, so the thing is that unions here have been weak uh, since, actually non-existent, I mean, weak uh, since, uh, um, since the beginnings of, beginnings of electronics here in the 1930s. Okay? And uh, there have been constant efforts since 1942 to unionize electronics in now is what is called Silicon Valley. Okay. And it always failed. So it started with iMac, I tell my color, uh, in, the, in the making power grid tubes, it moved to the microwave tube business with Varian, uh, HP, uh, all these companies. There were major efforts in the 50s and 60s to unionize these firms. It failed. Okay. And, uh, and this, of course, happened afterwards in semiconductors. And uh, with Atari, with uh, many other places. Hello. Uh, apparently, Marin County has three times incidence of breast cancer from uh, f uh, see. Apparently, Marin County has uh, three times uh, as much incidence of breast cancer than uh, a national average. Uh, and one theory is that it is a dumping ground for semiconductor industry. Did you find correlation of high percent cancer and other diseases due to these industries? So that, that's an, also an interesting question. And it turns out that Fairchild um, had a plant in San Rafael. Okay, that was making diodes uh, in the 1960s, and I think closed down maybe in the mid-1970s. And it turns out that it's also the source of pollution. Okay, and indeed, there was pollution uh, coming from there, and as far as I know, the aquifer around that plant is polluted now. Okay, so yes, there, there's a connection. It might not be the only one, but certainly a connection. And I think that was all the questions. So, thank you. <laughs>